Time is a crazy thing, and a lot can change in a decade. 20 years ago, if you asked children what they wanted to be when they grew up, they might tell you they wanted to be an astronaut or a doctor. And although there are obviously still kids who want to be these things, a new profession has emerged as the most sought after. A recent study showed that 34% of children in America want to be YouTubers, by far the biggest percentage of all the professions. And uh, you could imagine the comments. A huge number of youngsters are just a bunch of sad, overindulged, pathetic specimens with no backbone. We're not cavemen! We have technology! But although some people have inevitably used these findings to lament the newer generation's relationship with technology, change is the only thing that's constant in life. Just as the aspirations of the youth have changed throughout the years, so has YouTube itself. These days, it's not uncommon to hear about people who have become millionaires because of YouTube, and we all know about those YouTubers who just actively flex on their viewers. Because of the huge amount of opportunity YouTube offers, it's full of people striving to hit it big on the platform and make it their career. These days, YouTubers are able to make a living, whether it's from AdSense, merchandise, or other revenue streams. However, this wasn't always the case. In the early days of YouTube, people just uploaded videos for the fun of it. They were very scrappy and rough around the edges, but there's a certain charm to knowing that their output wasn't motivated by financial gain. But just as all things that have been around for a while, it changes, it evolves. And we've been through a lot of changes. Remember when we used to have video responses? Or what about the star ratings? Remember when Google Plus was the thing? There was also that brief time in 2011 where there were all these different reactions you could give a video, such as epic and fail and whatif. Obviously those did not take off, but it was pretty interesting to say the least. And it's kind of crazy to think about just how long YouTube has been around. To put it into perspective, people who were born on the day YouTube was created would be starting high school now. But one thing's for certain, the YouTube we know today is very, very different from the YouTube of the past. And with the huge amounts of content being uploaded to YouTube every second, and with how ubiquitous YouTube has become, that does create some problems. A quick visit to the ElsaGate subreddit will show you numerous examples of the amounts of disturbing content that has become accessible to children. You know, this whole ElsaGate thing is a huge topic in and of itself, and it has been for quite a long time now. But we now live in an age where this kind of stuff has never been more accessible. There are parents who just let the iPad babysit their kids, and there's some strange stuff out there. Car! <laughs> I mean, just go to the comment section of the video I made on this guy. It's like a freaking daycare. But that's not the only thing that's changed about YouTube. In this section of the video, I'm going to be discussing the recent controversies about the switch to abbreviated subcounts, as well as the whole verification kerfuffle. But if you've already heard about these things enough and just want to skip to the good stuff, then I'll put a timestamp on screen that you can skip ahead to. As you might know, YouTube recently decided to start abbreviating subcounts. So for example, for my channel, instead of 44,216, you just get the abbreviated version of it, 44.2k. There have been multiple theories about why they've done this. A big theory being proposed is that it's because of cancel culture, and people's inclination to flock to these live subscriber count streams. And it could be possible that YouTube just doesn't want all this drama-centered publicity. Another theory is that YouTube is trying to keep as many people on their own site as possible, since a lot of people just check Social Blade instead of YouTube's built-in analytics. So because of this, they've tried to integrate multiple things along the line to make it more appealing to use simply the YouTube built-in analytics, aka to keep the most amount of people using YouTube and no other website as possible. And one day, they decided that they were going to put their foot down on it. As you can imagine, removing something that has been part of the site since the beginning was a very unpopular decision. One of the most joyous experiences for many creators is being able to see themselves reach a subscriber milestone live. I mean, damn dude, just imagine. You're about to reach your first hundred, or thousand, or hundred thousand, and you get to see it the exact moment it happens. There's nothing quite like it. And now that possibility is gone. I mean, I guess you could stream yourself refreshing the creator studio, but it's just not the same. YouTube has gone on record to say, Beyond creating more consistency, this addresses creator concerns about stress and well-being, specifically around tracking public subscriber counts in real time. We hope this helps all creators focus on telling their story and experience less pressure about the numbers. 
I suppose I can see the argument that there are many creators who are just obsessed with the numbers and it's hurting their mental health, but you don't have to take it away from everybody. As one Twitter user commented, you already have a solution in place for this. Creators can hide subscriber counts. If a creator doesn't want live sub count streams, they can hide the info. If you want to add extra protection for the creators who feel this is bad, why not give the option for them to opt out of YouTube's API so sites like Social Blade can't access their channel data? That way everyone is happy, instead of appeasing a small amount of stressed creators. Continuing the pattern of changes nobody asked for, YouTube recently announced they had new eligibility requirements for verification, saying, Under our current eligibility requirements, channels with more than 100,000 subscribers can be verified regardless of need for proof of authenticity. That worked well when YouTube was smaller, but as YouTube has grown and the ecosystem has become more complex, we needed a new way to verify the identity of channels and help users find the official channel they're looking for. They also listed what the new criteria would be for verification. Authenticity. Does this channel belong to the real creator, artist, public figure, or company it claims to represent? Prominence. Does this channel represent a well-known or highly searched creator, artist, public figure, or company? Is this channel widely recognized outside of YouTube and have a strong presence online? Is this a popular channel that has a very similar name to many other channels? Like many people, I found the second one to be kind of strange. What does a creator's online presence outside of YouTube have to do with anything? What does it matter how many Instagram followers I have, for example? By the way, you should totally follow me on Instagram, gotta plug that. But what really got people going was when people started to receive emails saying that they would lose their verification badge. People were very unhappy, so YouTube eventually reversed the decision after the huge amounts of backlash, with Susan writing, To our creators and users, I'm sorry for the frustration and hurt that we caused with our new approach to verification. While trying to make improvements, we missed the mark. As I write this, we're working to address your concerns, and we'll have more updates soon. Update 1. We heard loud and clear how much the badge means to you. Channels that currently have verification will now keep it without appeal. We'll continue reviewing those channels to ensure we're protecting creators from impersonation. So, YouTube actually listened to their creators, and basically, if you already had a verification check, then they will not take it away. However, going forward, YouTube is going to take the time to review channels, and make sure that they are real and complete. And by complete, they mean your channel must be public and have a description, channel icon, and content, and be active on YouTube. On another positive note, YouTube is currently working on a way for demonetized videos to earn more money. In a video on the Creator Insider channel, they mentioned that they've started a new program, with the end goal of getting more revenue for videos with yellow icons. This would involve finding advertisers who are more interested in advertising on edgy content. For example, a trailer for an R-rated movie. So we've started a new program, explicitly with the goal of getting more revenue on yellow dollar signs. Okay. So the first thing we did is we went out and we figured out, okay, who are advertisers who have ads that are a little bit edgy? Like an advertiser who has a movie trailer for an R-rated movie. Now, those advertisers actually are more interested in writing on edgy content because that's where their audience is. That's, the, that's a good match make. Yeah. So, um, so we, we, we found these advertisers, they were excited about it. We started an experiment and the good news is that in the first month we ran hundreds of thousands of dollars on content that is not suitable for some advertisers. Definitely more to go in the future, but the good news is that the feedback we got from advertisers is they were excited about it. We feel like there's some potential there. This is a pretty big deal, but it seems to have been overshadowed by the whole sub count and verification controversies, so it just kind of flew under the radar. And as you guys know, with as big of a problem as demonetization has been for creators, any little improvement helps. Something else that's brought up in the video is that YouTube is working to improve the accuracy of which videos get the yellow icon that we all know is demonetization. One of the ways they plan to do this is through a program they call self-certification, in which the creators can mark for themselves whether or not the videos comply with guidelines. Self-certification gives creators the ability to let us know what's in their content. And if creators are able to do that, then we can give advertisers more confidence that they're running on that edgy stuff, but not the totally inappropriate stuff. There was another video from April 2018 from Creator Insider, in which the self-certification process is explained in more depth. And so the argument was, you know, uh, you as creators, you know your videos better than anyone, better than any, potentially, than any algorithm could. Um, and so what about this notion of self-certification? So they tested this out with a few creators, and they found that the majority of these self-certifications aligned pretty well with the decisions YouTube themselves would have made. So we ran a pilot with 15 creators, and before they published, they would answer a series of questions about the content of their video, 
that basically aligned with our ads guidelines. And it turns out that the majority of those self certifications were very consistent with the determinations we would have made internally with our human reviewers. In the description, they included a sample of the types of questions creators would have to answer. Among some of those questions are, does this video contain profanity or vulgarity? Does the video, audio, or images contain violent or graphic content? Does the video contain images of real firearms or weapons? Among others. However, there are still some things that need to be worked out, since this is a system that would rely heavily on trust and shared accountability. In the comment section of this video, PewDiePie had this to say. I like this idea the more I think about it, but I'm not sure how it would work on a large scale. Maybe if creators knew if you mistreat this system, it would only hurt you by making it harder to monetize future videos. As opposed to right now, everyone clicks confirmed for all ads and just hopes for the best. Nerd City also liked the idea, but had a few questions about the guidelines. Fantastic idea, Tom. This will teach creators what to look for in their own content, and it'll teach the bots how to rate the content better. A few questions about the wording of the form. How are bleeped swears to be handled? A lot of creators have started using a bleep tone over profanity, or have switched to a sound effect, like PewDiePie using oof Roblox noise or Jake Paul using a dolphin laugh. Is any of that still considered a marker for profanity? What constitutes limited clothing? Workout gear on women? Shirtless men? Bathing suits? Cleavage? Speaking of Nerd City, he recently uploaded a video called YouTube's Biggest Lie, which calls out YouTube for lying and saying that there is no list of words that get you demonetized when there clearly is. In the video, there is also the spreadsheet linked in the description of words that will get you demonetized, and it is very interesting. For instance, the word cancer is something that can get you demonetized, although you can see that there is an asterisk in the spreadsheet to indicate that it gets mixed results, and I can confirm this. For instance, one of my cancer vlogs got demonetized, but I also have three other videos with the word in the title that were fully monetized. The Quartering made a video talking about the recent findings by Nerd City, and he made a really good point that not a lot of people seem to be talking about. The idea that YouTube itself doesn't want to run ads on, you know, an LGBT creator versus somebody else is just categorically incorrect. It's a business. It wants to run ads on everybody. I just don't see an, a scenario where they're like, boy, we really don't want to monetize this person. A lot of this comes from social pressure. So when you see a lot of the demonetization, it's because of outright um, YouTube or uh, hate mobs outside of YouTube. All right. And in a similar vein, Hank Green said on Twitter, I try to keep in mind that YouTube is just jumping through hoops for advertisers. And without advertisers, everything is demonetized. But with that being said, it's still disingenuous of YouTube to claim that there is no system that outright demonetizes you based on the words that you use. A common question people have about demonetization is, why are advertisers more willing to advertise on TV, which shows edgy content, but not YouTube? Going back to the first video I showed about getting more money on demonetized videos, here's what they have to say. As we talked to more advertisers, we realized a couple of things. The first is, on TV, they feel like they have to run on edgy content to reach the audience that they want to reach, but on YouTube, they feel like there's so many videos out there, they don't need to take that risk. The, 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 second, the second factor is that on TV, they have the ability to preview content before it goes live. On YouTube, they don't. Yeah, and this is something that also boggled my mind. So, like, advertisers, there's potential that they just actually get the scripts. And like full on, they know exactly what's happening in, on content, so they yeah. really know whether they feel comfortable about their ads being shown alongside it or not. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And there's just so many videos on YouTube. Yes. That that's just unfeasible for us to be able to do because we're just so the scale is just so much larger here. However, although there may be some positive changes on the horizon regarding demonetization, many have commented on the increasingly corporate feel of YouTube. One of the ways you can see this is through the trending tab, which has been discussed time and time again. The YouTuber Coffee Break made a very in-depth video analyzing the trending tab, and he found that YouTube holds independent creators to a vastly different bar than traditional media. 95% of all news takes on trending is traditional media. That's ridiculously unfair to anyone seriously trying to do news right now independently. Philip DeFranco, for example, is one of the few YouTubers who even appeared on Trending, and it took him 1.4 million views on average to appear those two times on Trending. In comparison, the Associated Press trended seven times, and how many views did it take them to appear on Trending? 10,000. 
What's unfair in all of this has nothing to do with an extra creator here or there making it to trending. What's unfair is that YouTube has clearly put their hands on the levers to make it literally easier for traditional media to get on trending. It's an amazing video, and I'll put a link to it in the description if you haven't seen it yet. And from these findings, you can start to see how YouTube has become more about the corporation and less about the individual. This dichotomy between the corporation and the individual was the driving force behind the whole PewDiePie vs. T-Series thing. Yeah, it was a meme, but the fact that so many people were passionate about wanting a YouTuber in the number one position, rather than a faceless corporation, reflects a very real and genuine sentiment held by many. The types of channels that are most negatively affected by this increasing corporatization are the independent news and politics channels, and this actually affects both sides of the political aisle. When you search for something related to news and politics, you can see that YouTube's algorithm prioritizes mainstream media outlets over independent channels. Here's a clip from a video uploaded by The David Pakman Show, in which David discusses in great detail how the algorithmic changes affected his channel. If you are losing views from the recommended video algorithm, someone must be gaining those views. And I am now ready to tell you exactly who is gaining. And it's all corporate channels. If you look before May 1st, channels like mine and others were getting somewhere in the range of one to three percent of the recommended views in news and politics from this broader list of some of the largest news and politics channels. On May 1st, those numbers crashed and they went from between one and three percent to between 0.03 percent and half a percent, while at the exact same time, the recommended views for CNN's YouTube channel and MSNBC's and Fox News's increased. Out of all the recent changes to YouTube lately, I find it particularly egregious that they basically just squashed this entire genre of content in order to give traditional media an unfair advantage. And although I've seen a lot of talk about demonetization and poor decisions, I haven't seen as much talk about this in comparison. We've seen YouTube listen to their creators when they decided to reverse their decision about verification, but whether or not they're going to continue to do this is something that only time can tell. I mean, we've all seen that amazing like-to-dislike ratio on the 2018 Rewind, so it's going to be pretty interesting to see if YouTube is going to try to appeal to the community more this time. But as for YouTube itself, it's important to keep in mind that if you're going to criticize YouTube for doing something wrong, then you should also acknowledge when YouTube does something right. I do feel that there is a growing amount of people who just will never be happy no matter what YouTube does. I don't mean this as a generalization because there are a lot of reasonable people out there who are just expressing legitimate grievances, but I do think there's a rising sense of entitlement, as well as more and more people who are blaming the platform, or the algorithm, for their own lack of success. Am I saying YouTube's algorithm is infallible? Of course not. But I do believe that there are some people who just use it as a scapegoat to avoid having to face their own shortcomings. And because YouTube is such a common target and source of frustration, not many people are going to dispute that. After all, who wants to be a bootlicker? But this isn't me licking Susan's boots. I'm just saying that you need to take responsibility for your own success, or lack thereof. There's nothing wrong with being critical of YouTube, but there's a right way to do it, and a wrong way. I mean, just look at this tweet Susan made memorializing Grant Thompson, a YouTuber who has unfortunately passed away. And the replies are just filled with people chastising YouTube and complaining about its algorithm. You have this one guy over here who's just trying to pay his respects, and the reply to that is... R.I.P. to all content creators. She just censored, demonetized, and terminated all of YouTubers mistakenly. Look dude, I get it, but this is not the time nor the place. You're not sticking it to YouTube or Susan when you do things like this. You're just making an ass of yourself and disrespecting a dead man's legacy. But overall, YouTube is far from the same site as it was when it was created. There's no question that things are a lot more sanitized now, and it's taken a lot of fun out of the site. If Filthy Frank started just a few years later, he would be demonetized and possibly even terminated like Monkey Jones. And that's just really lame. YouTube continues to make decisions that the majority of creators don't want, and it's definitely becoming more corporate. And it really sucks to see corporations get special treatment over independent creators. But on the plus side, they are working on getting more advertisers for demonetized videos, and I think that's great. And there's still a lot of great opportunities that YouTube offers, such as the ability to connect with an audience, and that is something that I'm immensely grateful for. So what's going to be the future of YouTube, and what's going to happen? Well, everyone says that we should start an alternative to YouTube, but let's be real here, that's not going to happen anytime soon. It's true, we do have some alternatives, but those tend to appeal to more niche crowds rather than general audiences, and you can't make a viable alternative without a monetization model for the creators. Just consider that YouTube is owned by Google, and it's not even confirmed to be a profitable platform yet. 
Just think about how much money is needed to run a platform like YouTube. I mean, Boogie and McJuggernuggets are trying to sell Storyfire to us, but uh, I'm not feeling it, dude. We saw YouTube change course about the whole verification thing, but that's probably just an anomaly. I suppose we just need to make it clear. We're about YouTubers, not corporations. And I don't think Jimmy Kimmel needs any help from Mommy Susan. Anyway, that's about it for this video. I hope you liked it. What do you think the future of YouTube looks like? Let me know what you think in the comments, and you can also discuss it with me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm very interactive there. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.